keep pushing the envelope people on, on what's possible and try and really think about on both sides, what are all the objections on both sides and what do you do to help people overcome those objections? All right, everybody, welcome to the Big Picture Blueprint. I'm your host, Dan Habercost, along with Mason McDonald, and we have a great guest today that we'll get into here shortly. But in the meantime, Mason, how you doing? How, how's business going? Things are going well. I've got a handful of closings this week uh, all over the country. Uh, sales are picking up, acquisitions are picking up, and it's a great time of year to try and sprint towards the end. Dan, how are you doing today? Yeah, agreed. Uh, it is busy. We're doing deals all over. Southeast is still on fire, which you all have been hearing me say for months and months. And uh, historically, this is a great time of year to set yourself up for a strong start to the new year. So we are we are pushing right now. We're buying a lot. We're still selling a lot too. So it's, it's been fun. That's awesome. And I'm very, very excited about our guest today. I have heard a lot about her. I've gotten to meet her a few times, but Dan, why don't you introduce her? Yeah, so we have uh, Alicia, also known as AJ Jarrett, on the podcast today, and she's an entrepreneur all the way from Australia doing business in the United States, and she owns multiple businesses, including Global Citizens Holdings, Land Scouts, and Supercharged Offers, which is ultimately how her and I met. I, uh, I worked with her for a while. And so she's focused beyond her own business on helping other entrepreneurs get their land businesses started. And she has a lot of insight there being that she's done so from across from the other side of the world, which is pretty incredible. Uh, so we're going to talk through quite a bit today uh, with AJ, but uh, AJ, how are you doing? We're excited to have you here. Oh, guys, I'm so excited to be here too. And I just want to echo some things that both of you said, like Mason, I love that you said, you know, things are picking up, things are acquisitions is picking up, dispositions is picking up. Literally in the last month, I've seen a bit of a turnaround in the market, which is really exciting. You know, markets go through cycles and it might be a good topic to also talk about today, guys, because people are noticing the shift, right? But I agree with you. Now is a perfect time to be ramping up for a strong end of year and really start 2024 off with, uh, with a bank. So I'm super excited to be here and want to add as much value as I can to your audience. And yes, folks, I am an Aussie, so hence the accent. So one thing, Dan, I want to say up front as well, for anyone listening that feels like you can't do deals in the US unless you can see them, I'm doing this from the other side of the world, people. So there's no excuses, everyone. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And we, and I especially are excited to have an Aussie on the, on the show because stereotypical to most 90 kid, 90s kids, Steve Irwin was my idol growing up. Oh, and Mason. You know, I don't when I love him. <laughs> as vividly as I remember 9-11 to be dramatic. And AJ, I have to ask, what is the craziest yes. animal encounter you have had? Oh, goodness. Cra that, that, okay, how long have we got, guys? So um, probably the craziest animal encounter I've had. Um, so we, I grew up in country Australia, so I'm, I'm not from the city, even though I'm, I'm definitely a city girl now, but I grew up in the country where you'd wake up in the morning and open up the blinds to, from your bedroom and there's kangaroos in the front yard. So it's pretty cool. But probably the craziest one would be, um, I remember my mum growing up, we had this backyard that kind of went down a bit of a slope and she was out hanging clothes on the line and I was watching her and next minute I see her with the garden rake going like on the ground and I was like oh my god what's going on and a tiger snake which is one of Australia's deadliest tiger snakes had kind of come up to say hi and uh and the only thing she could do to protect herself was a garden rake so you know we do have all kinds of crazy animals but I will reassure everyone growing up in the country you get to see some crazy animal stuff but when you're in the city nah it's really nothing like, really nothing it just and I would also say I grew up swimming in the ocean where sharks were pretty prevalent, but you get sharks over here too, right? So that's not anything unusual. That's, that's exactly <laughs> right. We don't, we don't get too many in Colorado, uh, being in the middle, but uh, and not not where you guys are. <laughs> diving the Great Barrier Reef and surfing out there, uh, absolute bucket list, and can't can't wait to make that happen. Um, so thank you for sharing because oh. I I get to live vicariously through your animal experience. Uh, <laughs> AJ. You started out as a house flipper, is that correct? We did, yeah, Mason. We, um, about eight years ago now, we started fixing and flipping houses in Florida. 
um, all the way from Australia. And um, we did quite a few up to like a, a triplex as well. We had a, a three, three units in one that we did. And I absolutely loved house flipping. We even came over and, and just like you see on the TV shows, right? My business partner, Matt and I, we would be in the houses doing demo day with like sledgehammers and contractor crews. And it was awesome. We did quite a few properties remotely. And we did a few that we actually came over and got involved in. But our last property that we did, that's the one that forced us into vacant land. So, um, you know, houses is a challenge. It's a lot more difficult to do houses in any market, especially because it's such a competitive space, the single family home. Um, But also it's super competitive now to keep contractors, look at your your ARV for your properties once they're done. It's, It's so much different to what it was eight years ago. So we did like 18 months in houses, then we got out and switched to vacant land and we haven't looked back. <laughs> Very cool. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. Can you continue the story of what happened with that final house? That uh, uh, yes, I can, guys. So the last house that we did, and here's, here's the lesson in here, right? And I, and I look at what I'm about to share with you guys as a blessing um, because, you know, when you're a business owner, things don't go right all the time. You, you have bumps in the road, right? And I can see you laughing as I said that, Dan. It's not a straight path. It's not an easy route. So we had some great houses. They were all good. But our strategy was to do affordable housing. So we were going into areas around Jacksonville, Florida, and buying up houses that were, you know, fifteen to 25000 doing a, a basic fix and flip, but really making it, it affordable for people to move back into areas. Now, this is eight years ago where there was still a lot of houses that had just been left for no one to, to look at. Um, and that was great. But then our last house, we, we got a little bit, let me say we got diamonds in our eyes, if that was the word, because Matt and I drove past this house. We saw it on the market and we're like, that's a pretty nice house. I think we'll go check that out. So we did. We checked it out. We ran our numbers and we thought, I think we can do this one. This looks pretty good. But now we were talking buying it in the, the mid 200s and possibly selling it for the mid 500s. So it was way different to our strategy. But we thought, we can do this. We've done enough now. No, it didn't go to plan. This was a job that when we scoped it out, we thought three months rehab, um, we know the numbers, we'll be good. You know an onion, guys, when you peel back a layer of the onion and things just keep appearing? This is what this house was like. So, uh, So if it could go wrong, it did go wrong. We had contractors leaving in their droves because other people uh, two blocks down were paying them twice as much. We had a project manager that had a nervous breakdown, not because of us, but because life just got in the way for him. We had people come to the site and steal all our equipment and they even stole our fridge and our washing machine. And and it, you name it, if it could go wrong, it did go wrong. So what should have been a three-month project ended up being a 12-month project. And literally by the time we went to put that property back out on the market, the market had dropped. So we came out breaking even. Um, So did we lose anything? Not really. But what we did lose was an entire year of time working on this deal that really didn't yield us what what we wanted to. And that's when we stopped and went, you know what? I think the single fam space, whilst it's great, it really is something that you need to be here in person to do or have a really good contract team that you're providing them with enough work to keep them super busy. So that, guys, is where we started to explore different asset classes and we came across vacant land. And as I say, the rest is history. We've been doing vacant land now for seven years, six years, somewhere around there. <laughs> oh, wow. And and so six, seven years ago, uh, vacant land and land flipping was definitely a thing. And I think we can both relate and empathize with your experience of the peeling back the layer of the onion where with a single family home or even multifamily you can only find out so much from an inspection and during an inspection period. And all it takes yeah. is one or two or three things to go wrong for you to lose all of the potential profit of the deal. But AJ, how did you find out about vacant land and land flipping in general? And then how did you use the systems you had implemented in house flipping to apply it to the vacant land? Great question, Mason. So how we found it was through YouTube. Uh, I think we were just doing some Googling on, you know, what are different asset classes in the US and and just doing some general research and Jack Bosch kept popping up in front of us. And we're like, who is this crazy German guy that lives in the US? And I can say that now because Jack and Michelle are really good personal friends. And uh, so we, we came across that and Matt was like, hmm, vacant land. So we watched a few videos and just 
it all started to make sense because here's the thing, Mason, all the same principles that we used in doing vacant houses are exactly the same as what we are doing in vacant land, but the layers of the onion are so much less. Um, so the same principles around doing your due diligence on on areas to invest in, um, looking at what kinds of, you know, ARV, the after rehab value of a house, land still has the same principles, especially if that land has problems that maybe, you know, there's a title to work out, there's a probate that needs to be done. There's encroachment issues that you need to negotiate with the neighbor. So all of these things, that's kind of the rehab when you think about it for vacant land, right? And we thought, well, that's all just paperwork issues. We don't need a physical contract team to do that. Um, We have title companies and we already had a really good relationship with our title company. So then the next step for us was to have a good um, conversation with our realtor, who was actually our realtor helping us out with our single fam properties. We, We called up Michael and we're like, we're thinking vacant land and here's why. What do you think? And and at that time, like, you know, the vacant land market now certainly has a lot more people in it than what it used to. But at that time, there really wasn't a, a huge amount of people doing vacant land. And he said, heck yeah, let, let's get involved because number one, he's got people that are often looking for vacant land, but they can't, they don't know where or how to find the owners and, and go after them. And number two, he said, there's a lot of people that are looking to build and develop in certain areas. So let's let's kind of help them with that. So that's the journey started from there and onwards and upwards. That's awesome. So you started in Florida and and what a, a great transition that must have been because the complexity with housing is so much greater, as you mentioned, to reference the onion. You know, the due diligence item, especially in a lot of parts of Florida, depending on exactly where you're going, are yep. so, there, there's so, so many fewer items you have to check, especially if it's one of these failed subdivisions. So did you start right there in the Jacksonville Metro? Did you do a bunch of different areas? You know, what is your first couple uh, mail exam- campaigns look like and what, what came of that? Yeah, we started in the Jacksonville Metro, mainly because that was a market that we knew. Um, and since then, we've spread out through all of Florida. We actually haven't left Florida in seven to eight years or, or six to seven years, whatever it is. I lose count, guys. It's been that long. Uh, we've never left Florida because uh, I guess now in, in Florida we've got we've got a really good buyers list. We've got really good people on the ground. Um, so our realtor, our title company, our probate attorney, they're all Florida-based. And so now when it comes to doing deals there and even our, our real estate attorneys there, it's just so much easier. So we always say to people, you know, try, yes, it's okay to do a, a whole bunch of locations and deals all across the US, but if you really want to master an area, try and just keep repeating in that area because people will get to know you, be informed by what your buyers are wanting from you, like local builders and developers and things as well, and and build that up. So our first campaign in Metro Jacksonville now you're testing my brain here, Dan, because I can't remember what I did last week and you're asking me to go back seven years ago. Mm-hmm. But I remember that first deal. One of our first sellers and uh, was a lady by the name of April and it was an infill lot that had quite a slope on it. Um, so the the outsides, it was a corner lot, I remember, and the outsides of it were at street level, but then towards the back of the block, it went down quite quite a fair way. But the other blocks that backed onto it had already been backfilled and had retaining walls um, so the ability to, to fill this lot in was actually pretty good. So we thought, hmm, this is a perfect neighborhood. It's like a block from the river. It was a beautiful neighborhood, but everyone kept looking at the property and saying, can't really do much with that. So we actually went and got a quote on how, how much it cost to fill the property. And it wasn't anywhere near as much as what people think it is. Um, so we got that quote. We then included that quote in our disposition strategy. So we said, here's what it's going to cost to build on this property, but also you do need to fill it. But here's the quote to go and fill it. And then people were able to look at it and go, oh, that kind of makes sense. The numbers aren't that bad, right? And I remember that property sold in a matter of weeks. It was gone because there was no vacant land around the area, but people just kept looking at it going, ah. Um, One of our other ones was also about a 10 to 15 acre property that was all just marshland and scrubland. Um, But it was right next to a big development and we ended up selling that one for someone to do recreational stuff on. Again, you know, there's deals everywhere. And I always say to people, you are not your end buyer. Your end buyer is your end buyer, people. So, you know, don't look at a property and go, "Eh, not sure. We've got a couple of customers at the moment that I am talking to where, and I get that people are picky and choosy about what they want to do. But our job with supercharged offers is to get them leads. 
And and I had a call with a customer yesterday and said, yeah, I got 30 leads over the last month, but none of them fit my criteria. And I was like, well, how about we put your criteria aside and ask your buyers, what's their criteria? Because if you've got 30 leads in, you need to be getting offers out for all of them and then let the market tell you what it wants to do. Yeah. Not what you want to do. What does the market want to do? So, um, so we had to really think about that early on when we were doing deals, right? We had to keep reminding ourselves that we are not our end buyer. And the biggest deal that we've done to date was probably a property that if I had have looked at it on face value, in my own mind, I would have gone, not a deal. But it was our biggest deal yet. And it was one that I didn't think would be. So, you know. That, yeah. There's so much that everyone should go back and re-listen to what AJ just said right there. Because I think a lot of people in the land space will not think of the similarities to a retail home buyer. And that's really, really Unfortunately, it's very true in the land space where there's the end buyer that goes into a home and the granite countertops don't match exactly what they're looking for. And they'll make an emotional decision not to purchase that. And same yeah. thing with land of if there's a slope to it or there's something confusing to it where us three probably look at it, blank canvas, you can do anything now after doing hundreds of deals. But yeah. you might need to explain that to your end buyer and you can't go in with the assumptions that you are just one person. There's 300 million people in the United States. Your opinion doesn't matter. Uh, it's whoever yeah. whoever is on the back end. <laughs> and yeah, that sounds harsh, doesn't it? Your opinion doesn't matter, but it doesn't. It's the end buyer's opinion that matters. And what they're willing to pay. Yes, I'm so, I'm so glad you said this, uh, AJ. We just talked about this on a recent podcast where I said your opinion doesn't matter. What do other people like? I'm doing business at a bunch of places. I would never want to live, but who cares what I want? And to your other point, guys, super important. The end user is not educated in construction with that first infill lot she was mentioning. And so they look at that and think it's unbuildable. But we know, oh, this would probably be great for a walkout basement if it has a big slope and just put in a retaining wall, move some dirt. And so sometimes you have to factor in the cost to do that work. Or maybe if it's heavily wooded, just cutting in a driveway and approximate pad site, little items like that can create value for your end user who otherwise would not have seen it and can get you really good returns. So I'm glad you mentioned that. 100%, Dan. Yeah, 100%. And oh, I think people who are listening at the moment, what you've got to ask yourself is what are you willing to do for both the seller and the buyer that other people aren't doing? So if you just do that, that one or two things above what people do as base level, you're going to get more deals. So, you know, what are you willing to do on the seller side to help them out where it might be a difficult property, but if you're willing to get in there and, and make that work, they're going to thank you, you know, a hundred times over. Same with the buyer. If, if you can paint the picture for the buyer on how they can make this work, they're going to thank you a hundred times over as well. So just keep pushing the envelope people on, on what's possible and try and really think about on both sides, what are all the objections on both sides and what do you do to help people overcome those objections? Because that's actually your role as a, as a land investor. How do you overcome objections and obstacles so that people can make use of this stuff? Absolutely. And that that's something we, we want to hammer home because your entire value as a land flipper cannot just be purchasing properties at a discount. While there are yeah. the deals where that's easy, uh, if someone just wants to get rid of it, they don't care how much they're getting for it, and you can flip it for a profit. If you're adding buy value to the seller and the buyer, you're going to win. But uh, AJ, I, I want to switch gears a little bit. We, we've talked about it just a little. Supercharged offers. You're a systems person. You started investing from Australia and the United States. How, how was Supercharged Offers born, and what does Supercharged Offers do uh, for investors? Yeah, thanks, Mason. So how it was born is about five years ago now, my business partner, Matt, and I, we, we were looking at our, our own land business and really just seeing how inconsistent everything was. And it just felt really disjointed. Uh, we had six companies helping us out with our acquisitions. Someone for our data, someone for uh, that scrubbed our data, a VA, someone doing cold calling for us, another person that was hosting our website, um, another what was the other one uh someone who was managing our facebook ads and, and things as well and it was just and someone doing our printing and it was just like it, it felt like a full-time job just to manage all of that and so we were just wasting time on things and we were finding if one person didn't deliver it kind of fed out to the others and it just wasn't working so at the time i remember we said surely there's a company out there like this whole real estate space has got a lot of ancillary providers in it now Surely there's a company out there that can do that all in one. 
but there wasn't. We couldn't find one. <laughs> we found a lot more that did those six things, you know, lots more companies that are like, yeah, we'll do your data and your mailing. And we're like, but what about everything else? Like, how does that feed into that? And we really wanted to systematize that. So Supercharged Shoppers was born purely out of a need to help real estate investors centralize all of those functions into one um, and ensure that we can get some time back in the day for them to just be on the phone with sellers and buyers doing deals. And we've now got 20 people in our team at Supercharged Offers and we keep adding more products and services. So essentially we become like people's fractional marketing team. We do everything for them. All they need to do is tell us where they want to do deals and the types of deals. When leads come through, answer those leads, build that relationship, close it. Wow. Okay. I uh, I didn't realize you'd grown that business to that extent. So tw- 20 employees, that's a whole nother set of systems and processes yeah. and skills to put that team together, manage those people, and and then also take care of your clients on the other end, all while your land business is continuing to go. So can you speak a little bit more to how you put together your org chart, but then also how you take those people and mesh them with all those systems you create? Because that, that's a lot. That, that, that's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot. And I think sometimes from there, from the outside looking in, people would look at us and go, oh, you know, they're just a marketing company. It's like, no, there's a whole bunch of moving parts behind the back end. So in our team, we have um, four people on our data team, anyone from a data scientist to a data processors, a full-time comps person um, and, uh, and a, another data processor. So they're managing everything in our database because we've got a database of every single property in the US. We now have all MLS records in there as well. Um, we've got demographic information, census tract info. The, the database we're doing, we're working with is huge. Uh, but our data scientists, because we're we're not a front-end data person, so we're not like a data tree where you just plug in your numbers and you get a list. You actually work consultatively with our data team to say, well, here's what I ideally want to do. Can you guys run that query? And we can go into the database and run that. So we've got the data team. We've got a full-time um, content writer and social media manager got designers and developers a huge team of designers and developers because everything we build is custom that's the other thing i want to talk about here as well just pause on that for a sec when you're building out an online presence for your business folks really think about what you can do to differentiate your brand your value proposition how it is that you help you know we've got some customers we're building out campaigns for at the moment and coming back to what we said before about the value add this customer loves doing probate deals and they've got a very detailed strategy that they have around how they help people with probate. That's now part of their marketing. So we're building out this engine that talks about that a lot. And um, again, customizing things so that you stand out and you start to look different to the person next to you. So we've got a big design and development team for that um, and two salespeople that support me. So I'm actually, to your point, Dan, we hired our our new sales team about a month ago now and they're going great. And so that's allowing me to free up my time to focus more on our existing customers because we've now got a couple of hundred customers in nine countries all doing deals in the US. But it's not just vacant land. We've got people doing single family, self-storage, warehousing, RV parks, you name it, because we can do it for all of it, which is really exciting really exciting. Oh, I, I think that's incredibly exciting. And I, I want to dive more into the business too, because I see, um, I, I come from corporate background. So very used to very large data sets and expectations of doing true statistical analyses of there has to be uh, statistically significant data to prove a point and stuff like that. And it seems like with yeah. your systems and everything. So you said that uh, your users have to pick the market that they're doing business in. Does your analytics right. team have the ability to go in and say, all right, Dan, say say Dan comes to you and Dan's been doing business in Pueblo, West Colorado. And he says, these are the indicators that I think. Can your team go find a market similar to that somewhere in the country based on data or is that? We're not at that point yet, Mason, but that's something that we're building. So we've got two new products that will be coming out soon. One is coming out in the next few weeks called BuyerFinder where if you've got a property under contract, you'll be able to look it up in 60 seconds. You can find the property, find all the neighbors and cash buyers in the area and send them a letter. That's been a work in progress for two years. And again, when we release it, people are going to look at the front end and go, oh, that's really simple because it's about making the the tough stuff simple, right? But behind it, oh my goodness, there is an entire data engine behind it managing that. The second thing we're going to be releasing next year is called Insights Finder. 
And that will be a front end dashboard that you can do those queries, Mason. You can go in and and kind of look at insights in different markets to be able to, as I said, all in one, look at the analytics around what are the things that a market is telling us? You know, average price per acre, days on market, what the the differential is between assessed value and retail value, like what are people paying? Um, transaction amounts, uh, you know, what the houses are going for in the area compared to land, a whole range of different things that you'll be able to do with that. So watch this space, guys. There's more coming around there. That's so cool. Geeking out right now, and my my wife will be very excited to listen to this episode. She was a uh, business intelligence developer, and now she's a back went back end data engineer. So this is uh... oh, does she want to come work with us? <laughs> she might. So I don't know if she can hear me upstairs, but Rachel, we have a potential job offer for you. Uh, but, but I I think um, so. We talk a lot on this show about land investing, real estate investing, and everything like that. But you've in, in this world, um, this is a really product-based company that you have here. How do how does a new product come to being within Supercharged Offers or any of your companies? And uh, how like kind of explain the product life cycle? Yeah, well, that's a oh how how long have we got, guys? So product life. Cycle. The first thing is we do have a dedicated product development side to our business. So when we were developing things like Buyer Finder and Insights Finder. The good news is my, my business partner, Matt, actually has a, a technology background. So he understands not only data and tech, but also product development. Um, and our UX, UI designers, and we, we've also outsourced to like a product development team that is doing like the infrastructure that sits behind things. So what we're really looking at for a product, I guess our ethos when we're building out a product is, is there a need for it? Yes. And we, we know that from what customers are telling us and, and by looking in the market and seeing if there's anything similar. Um, or doesn't exist. And if there's a need for it, how do we make it easy? Because the other thing that I've noticed, Mason, to your question is there's a lot of, as I mentioned before, there's loads of different ancillary products and services out there, but not all of them are easy to use. Not all of them are actually what I would call functional either. You know, the user interface on how easy we help people to solve their problems, it has to be quick, easy, simple, and anyone can use it. So using that as kind of the, the ethos behind product development, that's really what, what we're aiming to do. Because um, again, you know, the, the whole role of a real estate investor is do your deals. Do I spend time crunching data and, you know, all these other things that you have to do for your business, but perhaps it's not the best use of your time. So we need to take that, that factor into account around time. How easy are these products for people to use? So we're saving them time and getting them more efficient. That's incredible. I mean, it, it really is, guys. Uh, I'm, I'm obsessed with the technology within the real estate space. And uh, we, we both Dan and I have used various CRMs and services and everything like that. And what AJ is saying here is it's a turnkey package that it is all of the stuff that you can outsource in a way where you can figure out what your highest and best use of your time is while you let them yeah. uh, work with you as a partner in this transaction. So th this is super yeah. cool. I'm, I'm getting too excited and talking about yeah. it. I'll, I'll hand the mic over to Dan because I'm just geeking out right now. <laughs> we need to have another call where we geek out together, Mason. <laughs> a whole other point that I wanted to make too is to the beginning of your story about supercharged offers, where did it come from? It's because you had a problem. You looked for a company to go solve it and the company didn't exist. So you created that company. And that is often how the best businesses are born. Because you talk to a few people in land and you'll find we all have the same problems. And so AJ is solving one of those major problems via supercharged offers. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the thing that I love the most, like I, I just the fact that our customers get results. I was on a call um, the other week that a customer made me cry because he's like, you know, he's four months in, he's never done land before. He's, his name's Doug from Texas and he's, he's done a lot of mobile home stuff. Four months into land and he's, he was closing two transactions that week with 50K profit and had another 120k worth of deals that he was sitting on and he said and i've hardly had to touch it like you guys have literally done it all for me all i've had to do is answer the phone I'm like yes that that's weak that's what you should be doing doug because these days and i think if we can segue into into this topic you know we've had a few customers lately that have said oh, i'm not getting the response rates i was used to like you know back a couple of years ago i was getting three or four percent and i was like guess what so are we but properties do go in cycles, right? And and we're now in a cycle that we need to adjust to what the market is doing because if you listen to the news, it's all going downhill, guys. 
And so our property owners, they're listening to that and they're our sellers. They're holding on for dear life and saying, you know, I don't want to sell my property yet unless I can get top dollar whilst they're hearing the news that things are doing this. So you're going to have different conversations with sellers, but also buyers are, um, and I'm, I'm talking general here, guys, it's not the same in every area as you guys know, but buyers are like, I want to build, but I can't build right now because interest rates are way too high, but I want to buy the property while it's low and then maybe build in two or three years time when things settle back down. So Buyers are looking for a lot more seller financing and lease options and things like that. And I guess the reason why I say this is marketing is only one component of your business. Strategy is a huge component. And as a real estate investor, you need to always be across like, what is the market doing? Where's it going? And what do I need to adjust from not only my marketing perspective, but maybe my solutions that I'm providing out to the market so that I can adjust what's happening as the market goes in its flow. You're bringing up current market, which is where I was going to go anyway. So you read my mind there. But <laughs> this overarching point about the fact that things are always changing is so essential, guys. If you want to just start a business and do what you always have done, you're going to get phased out very quickly. You're going to lose and you have to always be adapting. And number two, don't let a ridiculously good ROI on Mailer from a few years ago stop you just because it's not quite as good, but compared to any other asset class, still really, really good. And so I'll never, yes, it's, thank you, man. I, I have to quickly tell this story because you never know what you have until it's gone. When I initially started mailing in Pueblo West, I would get a deal with a 10 to $20,000 profit off of a hundred mailers. I could spend $50. <laughs> and of course there wasn't unlimited lead. So I couldn't just go spend a million dollars and get that kind of return. But every hundred mailers I would send there, I'd get a deal where I'd net 10 to 20. And I didn't know what it had, but I think about that today, looking back on that, and I go, oh, well, if I can spend about $1,000 to get a deal, netting me something around 15 to 20, sometimes more, that's still a fantastic return. I probably should ramp up my mail just like I should have ramped up my mail back then. So there's several points I wanted to make there. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what is then is not now. Um, and, and, and what is now is not going to be in 12 months time, 24 months time. Like this, this is an industry that forever is evolving. Um, you know, even to the point that well, you said Mason before, you know, don't expect to just buy a property low and sell it high anymore. These days it's buy a property fairly, but help the seller out to make sure that you can go above and beyond. Right. And it might be that you buy something these days at 50 cents on the dollar, but sell it at 85, 90 cents on the dollar. Gone are the days where it's like, way down here and you know it, th- those were good times right but so- properties go in cycles and markets go in cycles and I think at the moment we're definitely in that cycle where we've got to all be flexible and, and also be realistic about current expectations like I always say to people 24 36 months ago it was quantity and quality so quantity meaning higher response rates but there's some really good deals in there now Quantity is is lower, so people are getting lower response rates because the market's tightened and there's a lot more people in the market now. So I'm saying, what is your measure of success? Because your KPIs, yes, you need to be looking at response rates and conversion rates, but more than ever, what we should be focused on now is what's our return on investment overall? So if I put $10,000 in, am I making 30 to 50? Um, If I put $10,000 in, am I making 60,000? Am I making like, what is that? Because sometimes it's only about one good deal and you're into profit. You're, you're you're hitting on so many amazing points. And I think people that are in the entrepreneurial space or in real estate investing or listen to the podcast, uh, it it's confusing sometimes. Because if you work in a different environment and 8% operating margin on your P&L, if you're, if you're getting 8%, EBITDA, like you're killing it in a lot of places. But here we're talking put 10 grand in, make 50,000. Are you kidding me? That's incredible. That's outrageously amazing. But recognize guys, comparison is the thief of joy. Dan's talking about sending a hundred letters and doing that. My first 300 letters resulted in six figures of profit on my first deal. So it's like, yeah, that's never happened again. But it, uh, <laughs> comparison is also the thief of joy within our own businesses too. But oh uh, yeah, AJ, I kind of want to shift gears and talk about once again, stuff that I want to talk about, um, which is, is leadership. And yep. I think that with what you've created and you have, uh, you're, you're also a leadership and executive coach, I believe. Do you think 
leadership is for everyone, yes or no? And then two, and a follow-up question to that, within entrepreneurs, what do you think is more important, technical skills or soft skills? Oh, Mason, uh, you're coming out with the big guns today. I love it. So first of all, is leadership for everyone? No, it's not. Uh, and I think we've all got to ask ourselves the question, honestly, what am I passionate about that is also leading into what am I good at? Because being good at something and enjoying it are two different things. And I often see people that are good at something, but they don't enjoy it. And that translates to a, a culture, right? You know, because they're kind of dragging their feet behind them. So when it comes to leadership, Let's, let's define leadership, first of all, as opposed to management. So management is really about the management of things. How am I managing our KPIs, our processes, our systems, what our people are doing? Leadership is how do I create the right strategic direction for our business and create followership with our people so that our people in their jobs not only know what they're doing, but what's the bigger purpose at the end of the day and how do we make that meaningful to them? So that's really leadership. And I guess if we can break that down further, because in the land investing space, there's really two buckets here. One is people that say that they're leaders because they've got virtual assistants. That's not leadership. That's management. Unless, of course, you're virtual assistants, number one, you're not calling them BAs. You're actually saying, hey, this is our customer service team. This is our um, due diligence team. They're part of our business and they serve a purpose for this bigger purpose. And they all know what that is. That's leadership. And I see too often in this business that people get to that that tipping point where they get busy and then it's like, right, well, now I don't need a person to plug, plug a gap. My one piece of advice here, people listening, number one, definitely make sure that if you're going to hire virtual assistants that you know how to do the job yourself because you need to do things like write your SOPs, manage them, give feedback, et cetera. So make sure you've got that set up. Number two, Give them full ownership of stuff. I see too many people that just pass a problem to a VA and then they expect results. And it's like, but unless we've given them the tools to be able to work through that and come up with solutions and be creative, we're not going to get the result we need. And then we end up with a people problem. You know, we thought we were busy before, but now we're managing people because they're not delivering what we want. So I always like to say to people, put up the mirror, first of all, and just ask yourself, what does good look like? How do I ensure that I get that good? What are the processes and systems I'm putting in place to get that? And then let's plug that with a person, not the other way around. Um, I could go on forever about leadership stuff, but I don't know if I've answered your question, Mason. <laughs> you absolutely have. And AJ, I mean, th this is so fantastic. And I'm looking forward to sharing this, this specific episode with a lot of my hospital administrator friends, because what you're saying is so relevant and applicable to every single industry out there where in approaching problems, you look at everything from a process or a people issue. And a lot of the time it's a process issue. And I ran into that all the time at the hospital yeah. where I'd have managers and directors and, and chiefs come to me and say, hey, this employee had this issue. This is what happened. And I'd say, okay, show me the standard operating procedure that outlined what they were supposed to be doing and show me the last time they were trained on it. And be like, oh, we don't have one. And then I'm like, well, that's your fault then. And, there you, there it is. and, and that right there, I, I think you guys have to recognize that within this business, a lot of it at the beginning is you, you go from being an employee owner operator where you have to do it. You have to figure out the best systems, processes, and policies and procedures to make things done. Then you kind of move into that management role where you start delegating. Uh, and then you move into a leadership role, which is exactly what AJ is saying, where people should be inspired by the vision that you are creating. And with what you have created in your business, AJ and Dan with yours and, and with mine, it's, it's inspirational. It's just, you have to capitalize that on that by finding the right people, but I'll hop off my soapbox because it sounds like you and I could talk about leadership for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is, it is. And I really love what you said there, Mason. And if I can add one thing in here for people and to reassure them, when you go out to hire someone, it doesn't mean that you need all of your standard operating procedures in place. Because sometimes we're growing, the, the analogy we like to use is sometimes we're flying an aeroplane at the same time that we're building it, right? Um, you know, we're putting a wing on here, we're putting an engine back there, it's, it's all this stuff. But involve your person that you're hiring in your SOPs and do it really simply. Like every process, film it with them, give them an SOP template and get them to then listen to the, to the video and write out the SOP. 
Because if you think about the way that an adult brain works, we have different modalities. So we have auditory, we have kinesthetic, we have visual, and we have analytical. Um, the whole process of watching something, having to disseminate that information and write it up pretty much uses all four. So that's a great way to, to teach your people and then use that as the way to build up your SOPs. But don't expect to have someone recruit them and not have that process as part of that that hiring, right? Set people up for success, people. Absolutely. Yeah. Completely agree. And I think uh, that right there is so crucial because just hiring an employee is not going to solve your problems if you don't know what they are and you're not capable of defining them where uh, you have you have to have something in line and then include them because then there's that ownership component, which is which is just so important. Yeah, a great. Uh, so another question we had along the lines of supercharged offers, you have the uh, rare insight of working with a large volume of people in our business, right? The buying and selling and improving of land. And so if you have a pretty big sample size, which can give you a decent representation of the average, is there anything you consistently see in the clients that are successful versus the ones that fall off and give up? Yep, definitely. Um, the ones that are successful, number one, it's about customer responsiveness. So the leads that come in, number one, they're not sending them to voicemail. That was five years ago, people. If you're still sending people to voicemail, um, you're losing an opportunity because let's put ourselves in our seller's shoes for a sec. The minute they're calling someone, they want to speak to a human. Now that doesn't have to be you. You can send it to an intake person. Like we send all of our calls now to answer first. That's our, our intake. They do a quick triage, send the lead through to us. We're good to go. But they, they physically speak to someone because that first response and that first interaction has to set the scene for what's about to follow. Um, number two, the people that are more successful are getting back to their leads either same day or within 24 hours. They're making sure that they're finalizing offers and getting any, if it's a blind offer, they're redoing or renegotiating, or if it's a neutral letter or a postcard or something, they're getting an offer in front of them in like 24 to 48 hours. The ones that aren't successful, um, oh, let me actually continue on the ones that are. They've then got a very detailed process and, and we work with our customers on this to really help them define that strategy. Once offers have gone out, um, so let's say they're, they're sending out a whole bunch of offer ones. If those people haven't responded, offer twos are going out within like four weeks. Offer sometimes offer threes are going out another four to six weeks after that. In between there, they're doing things like a cold call follow-up or maybe a ringless voicemail just to say, hey, we've sent you an offer. Would love to know if you've had a chance to review it. One step further than that is they're doing a personal call. Hey, I sent you an offer yesterday. It's in your inbox. Have you got time now so I can open it and go through it with you? See what questions you've got. The whole element around customer service, opening up, you know, means of dialogue for customers to be able to interact with you is everything these days. And if we go through those offers and people still haven't converted, put them into a drip sequence. Actually say to your prospect, look, we, we haven't landed on the right price yet. I know you want to sell. And I know I want to buy, but we just haven't gotten to that point yet. So can we just keep in touch over the next few months just to keep the lines of communication open and see where things go? 95% of people will say yes to that, especially the older people, because they love to chat. And what you want to do then is don't make that a sales call. Get to know them every couple of weeks. Hey, Dan, just checking in. How's the family going? How's everything with your land? It's not a price conversation. It's a, it's a relationship conversation. Three weeks after that, if they're still not ready, pop a quick email. Hey, Dan, just checking in. Hope you've had a great week. would love to know how, how progress is going on the vacant land. Eventually, like this is a relationship business before it's a real estate business. Or well, the other way to put it is it's people before properties. So people that do all that stuff, they're more successful. The ones that do all the opposite to that, not as successful. Yeah. I mean, you'll hear both of us preaching about follow-up constantly. And, and that's a great corollary to the follow-up of, not just being transactional and, hey, can you sell? Hey, will you sell me yet? No, no, no. You're actually getting to know them. You're building rapport, building a relationship. I'll give you an example. This week, we have a lead we've been working for, I don't know, six or seven months. They're in our long-term follow-up category in Pebble. And my acquisition manager will call him about once a month. And he goes, you know, I think I'm going to be ready to sell next month. But regardless, if I sell, I'll sell to you guys. I won't even talk to anyone else. At this point, there it is. exactly. It's relationship before real estate, people. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, we're working one at the moment that's been about 10 months in the making and it's a subdivision lot and um, we've had attorneys involved, but I, even outside the attorneys, I'm just dropping this guy line every few weeks and just saying, hey, I'm still here, just checking in, how you doing? And, uh, and this is going to be a seven-figure deal by the time it gets over the line. So, you know, work the big stuff, guys. Work, work the relationships. And there's actually another person out there um, uh, who's, oh, God, his name escapes me at the moment, but his tagline is TTP, which is talk to people. It's Brent Daniels, yeah, yeah. from Holes. Brent Daniels, yes, yes, I, I do know Brent. Yeah, talk to people. Talk to people. And, <laughs> and the, there's just been so, so much to unpack there, and I, I think the kind of the lesson – around a lot of what we've been talking about with uh, leadership and people and processes and real estate is that the soft skills, the people impact, the customer facing is the most important aspect of this business. Yeah. Because yeah. at the end of the day, it's not a complicated system of you find markets that are producing, you send direct mail or cold calling campaigns, and then you follow up with your leads. However, that talking on the phone component, the consistent language to match whatever your seller avatar is, that's the stuff that really, really will differentiate the successful people that are taking action versus the unsuccessful people that are also taking action. But AJ, for the sake of trying to keep this whole show under an hour, give or take, uh, what questions did we not ask you that you wish we had asked you? Oh, That's a really good question, Mason. Um, I guess you probably could ask me, like, what what are we doing in our land biz at the moment? Because uh, obviously the the focus of the conversation has been supercharged offers. So, um, uh, you know, what are we noticing that, that we're doing? Because we, we've really changed our strategy this year a lot. And um, so we're now only going after big entitlement deals uh, and, and really looking at four or five projects a year. That is it. So when I talked before about quality versus quantity, we're only going after quality deals now. Um, and that I'm not to say that that's for everyone. So, you know, everyone has to choose what their strategy is. And the main reason why we had to switch to that was really about time because, number one, the supercharged office is now our main business, not our land business. Um, and our customers in that are everything to us. But number two, um, what can we also, coming back to like when we change strategy into vacant land, I think we've always got to ask ourselves, what is the strategy that we're doing and does this fit my business model and my lifestyle model that I want at the moment? Because all the, re the reasons why people get into these businesses, yes, it's about making money and putting food on the table, but a lot of the reasons people do this is lifestyle. Yeah. You know, the laptop lifestyle, having a laptop and a phone and we've done deals from all over the world. Yeah. But, um, you know, always ask yourself, folks, what's the strategy that's suitable for you at this point in time? Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up. That actually led to the question I was going to ask, ask next. I'm not in your head today, Dad. <laughs> we're on the same page, AJ. But, uh, you know, I, I am a strong proponent of that. I, I like to travel as well, just like you. And I see on your uh, bio here, you've done deals from a yacht in Croatia or from the snow in France. Can you tell us a little bit about that for a fun question? Yeah. Yeah. The yacht in Croatia was an interesting one. We we're literally bobbing in the middle of the ocean between the islands. Um, so we weren't like on an island hooked up to any, um, any uh, Wi-Fi or anything. We we're in the middle of the ocean, little satellite on the boat and we were doing dial up to transfer money to our title company. It was like, yeah. ding, 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 ding. and we're like, come on, go through, go through. And we're on a boat. But we made it happen. And then um, when we were in France, this is going back a few years ago, pre-COVID, um, we sold a property and we had to get uh, get it all notarized. Um, and we were like, hmm, we're in the middle of the ski slopes in France. How does this happen? But again, jump on Google. How do I find a notary in, in France? And it turns out they're called an attaché notaire, uh, which sounds very posh. And uh, over there in France, that actually means that they're attorneys. They're not just notaries. Uh, so we had to find one. We booked it in and we literally skied across the mountain with paperwork under our arm in our ski boots and uh, got it signed and FedExed it off. And it was like, deal done. Yeah. So literally, it does not matter where you are in the world. You can get stuff done. Yeah, that's awesome. I have a vivid memory of trying to find on top of a mountain in Breckenridge last year where I could get enough service to download and sign and then wire <laughs> money to close a deal in, in North Carolina from 12,000 feet in Colorado. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you got a laptop and a phone, you can do business anywhere. 
That's exactly right. A AJ, I mean, that's amazing uh, being able to do deals around the world. And just like you said, look at your individual risk tolerance and your kind of your personality and everything. And you can explore the land flipping business or any any way to integrate within the real estate business or any businesses all, at all of. If your goal is to make a million dollars, would you rather do it in two deals uh, that each make half a million or a hundred that make 10,000 or a thousand that make a thousand? I'm not great at math <laughs> calculator, but you guys. And then that's round numbers. <laughs> and, and those are round numbers is the problem, but uh, um, and, and I'm still bad at it. But AJ, <laughs> what do you want to leave the audience with? Uh, any last minute thoughts, insights? Where can people find out more about you? How can they get in touch with you? Yeah, I guess some last minute thoughts and insights is don't let the media and what everybody else is saying and doing sway you from your true passion and what it is that you want to do. If you want to do land, just jump in and keep consistent because there's a lot of hype out there at the moment of is land oversaturated and, you know, is this market got too many people in it and people aren't getting response rates here and there. You are going to find that in this business, guys listening, there are going to be bumps in the road. There will be months that you'll have no deals. There'll be months that you'll get loads of deals. But just just know that when you stick the course, this business does work. Uh, I think these guys have been around long enough and so have I to tell you that we're living proof that as long as you keep working the system, the system will work for you. But think about where you spend your time um, and think about what is, you know, the, the revenue producing activities, right? Um, cause that's, that's the most important thing. You're not in this business to be doing stuff. That's not going to generate you money. Absolutely. Otherwise you're in the wrong business. <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah. Well, yeah. And in terms of where people can find me guys, I'm more than happy to jump on a call with anyone at any time. You know, Dan knows that I'm, I'm always available and I work crazy hours, but I'm here for, for this community. Cause I do feel that land is a, an amazing community to be a part of, you know, people link arms and do deals together all the time and I can help. Um, make that happen too. So just go to superchargedoffers.com or drop me an email at uh, alicia at superchargedoffers.com or go to our Facebook page. Loads of happy customers on there. And I'd be more than happy to chat with you, everyone. Awesome. Awesome. Well, everyone, that was the great Alicia Jarrett or AJ from Supercharged Offers. Uh, and this was absolutely fantastic. And we're so appreciative of having you on the show. You've left both of us with a lot to think about within our own businesses. And the same for the audience. So thank you. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. And looking forward to, to helping you guys out with your new venture too in the in the coming weeks as well. Awesome, awesome. And everyone, this is Mason McDonald and Dan Habercost with the Big Picture Blueprint signing off.